How about now? You got me, you got me now? Got me now? Can you hear now? Can you hear now? Can you hear now? Good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, fantastic. I think I think we're I think we're is operating headspace. I think I was on my mic was over on mute. Okay. So uh, audio. No, Catherine, you can't hear either. What's what is going on? Hold on a second. Let me let me punch in here. Okay, Catherine says yes. Okay, great. Whew, okay, I am just like going crazy right now. What is happening? All right, so let's restart it. <laughs> going on again. I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. Um, Saint Rodney Freese is on. Thank you, Catherine Johnson and uh, Carolyn Strauss. Yes. Okay, we got that. Let's put them up there. Carolyn says yes. They're hearing me. Rodney says yes. He does. Catherine says yes. And so thank you for much. I, I really appreciate that uh, for um, sharing that with me because I didn't know. I didn't know what I'm pushing out there. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm John Register, owner of Inspired Communications International. I'm on the road once again because we are back out of this whole uh, whole whole uh, pandemic thing, I guess, because people are out and about. Man, the airports are crowded like crazy. I can't believe this, how much people are out there right now. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. Catherine says, yes, now, good. Um, they are out and about, man. I mean, the, I was jam-packed. I was like this against the wall <laughs> on the plane. I was like, dude, can you give me just a little space, just a little space? And I mean, I'm not a simple, big guy, too. So anyway, so we're having a good, great time out here. I'm at Deloitte University down in Dallas, University, D Dallas, Texas right now, uh, getting ready to do a presentation to uh, all their lawyer team uh, this afternoon. So I'm really excited about that, get a chance to talk about this new normal mindset concept that we've been pushing out there in this reckoning moment, the um, the transformation and the new normal mindset. So that's been going fantastic. Then we, uh, the other day, we were speaking to the Colorado Workers Comp. So think about all the things that they have been through, all the transitions that they have gone through uh, when it comes to uh, the, the whole mental health aspect of us returning to work and, and off going through this time of, of, um, of, of recovery. And then uh, SGI in Orlando tomorrow. So those are all the trade associations. So Rodney's on. I saw Rodney Freeze is on. He's the guy that comes over and does all the stuff in my house, man. I trust him like my brother in the back of my hand. Uh, he, he does some great work um, and he does uh, you know HVAC and those type of things. But just a really great guy, great family uh, out there. So thanks, Rodney. For Rodney for being on. So I'm going down to Orlando to talk to their association, this SGI. Uh, they're all the HVAC folks, the plumbing folks, and the electrical folks that um, that you know service us. You know when when things break and stuff. That they got a hard hard job. So I was honored uh, a couple weeks ago, weekends ago, and now it's just come out. I can let, let the cat out the bag because it's out there. <clears throat> One of Ellen's producers called for me to be a speaker coach for a double leg amputee uh, after she's learned how to walk after 16 years and uh, she has a desire to become a motivational speaker. So who they reach out to? How did they even find me? <laughs> that was crazy. So I uh, went out and we did that and the show is out right now. So we're really, uh, really happy about um, about doing that show for for Ellen. And, and uh, I know her show is about to go off, but she's going on Ellen Tube and you can catch that episodes going out there on Ellen Tube. Uh, and we're doing that with that that young uh, woman who is uh, becoming a, a speaker. So today uh, I have a fantastic guest. We're going to be have him on because um, I've known him for a little while. And he's just one of these individuals that's so eclectic, so unique, just so uh, every time I talk to him about something, I feel like uh, my brain is, is just in increasing and expanding because he's just so wicked smart. And I'm going to bring him on in just a second. But let me do him as propers. Uh, he, he's provided testimony on Capitol Hill seven times, authored key portions of the first net slash D black legislation, developed the public safety interoperable uh, communications campaign policy paper, which became part of President Barack Obama's administrative agenda, worked with Senator John McCain's staff and contributed public safety measures, uh, amendments in the Intelligence Reform Act of 2004 and various iterations of the Saves Lives uh, legislation. So you see he's working both sides of the aisle because he is in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, led the development of the nation's first two citywide public safety 700 megahertz wireless networks. He is the absolutely coolest guy, one of the coolest guys I know is all over the place, has a beautiful family, and has just uh, been a great confidant and friend. Please welcome to the show the one and only Mr. Robert 
Fran, ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, I got you five by five. Um, awesome. Really good. Awesome. So I was like, what is going on with my stream this morning? So I don't know what <laughs> is happening there. But I'm glad that Miss Johnson was on, Catherine Str Karen, Carolyn Strauss was on, and Rodney Freeze was on to tell me, and the Facebook user saying, yes, yeah, so we, I was having problems. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, it's good to see you. It's good to see you as well, sir. Good to see you and so proud of all the things I see you doing. I follow you mostly on LinkedIn and uh, just um, just uh, you continue to be an inspiration to me um, and my children. As you know, we raise our children in church together. Yeah. And um, that, um, you know, that's those are those are tender moments that that really matter in, in my children's life. And I hope I mattered in your children's life. as Ab well. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's great. You know, and for those that don't know, we were living in Virginia uh, for a period of time for, for 10 years. And that was a very we we're very young at that time. And our families were coming up together. So we we're all trying to figure it out what which direction what we wanted to go in life. And and so, yes. And then so later on in life, my daughter goes back to the dc area and uh is right back there at the same church and all the kids are growing up right so they're interning together now they're interns and it was just, it was just fantastic man it's, just, it's so awesome uh, as life continues to move forward well i want to don't want to play with the point i want to get into this because you you know i never knew, knew what absolutely what you did but i knew you're always in tech stuff you're always doing that stuff so yeah. tell us a little bit about the, the 700 megahertz you know how it's interfacing and kind of your work what you do uh, i want to get into how you got the opportunity but uh, but mostly just kind of the 700 megahertz because i always knew it as uhf and when i wanted to watch ultraman on the higher <laughs> channel, channel. exactly exactly you had to move the antennas around to get ultraman i was doing exactly. it myself it's like when you stop <laughs> somebody stop moving a tv station around maybe we'll have a... <laughs> well, you know that's that's interesting because that's exactly where it came from um mm -hmm. so the work that this this revolves around at least 700 megahertz revolves around is um it goes back you know regrettably to um 1983 that tragedy when the plane um, crashed in, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It goes back to 9-11 when our first responders weren't able to receive the signals inside of the buildings and, and, and unfortunately, regrettably, terribly perished because wow. just pro problems with communications for our first responders. Um, in 2001, I actually found myself unemployed, <laughs> and, you know, because that was when the the IT bu bubble burst and all the IT people in Washington, D.C. were like, oh, great, this is wonderful. Um, so I ended up um, finding a job as the deputy chief technology officer with the Washington, D.C. government. Now, I'd worked in military um, um, technology before. I've worked on nuclear attack submarines and missile systems. Um, I was certainly moved like everyone else about, you know, wanting to do something more for the country because across the country, our first responders, um, their communication systems were, 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 were subpar as the bottom line and disparate and non-interoperable. Well, in Washington, D.C., I mean, you have 19 jurisdictions, you have all these federal agencies, and it was really, really bad when it came to communication systems in D.C. when I took the job. Last deputy in gets the hardest job working with police and fire. That's a difficult job. But fortunately, the United States Navy prepared me for that. So, you know, <laughs> if you've been, you haven't been cursed out until you've been cursed out by somebody from the Navy. So but not to say that the police and fire were a pushover. I mean, they were walking around with weapons and, and axes and things. But, you know, so I had to, um, the mayor did something interesting, Mayor Williams, you know, did something interesting. He took the money from the police, took the money from the fire, and he gave it to the IT department and said, go fix the problem. That was unique um, then, and uh, didn't cause a lot of friends for me, but we got the job done, and we resolved interoperability, excuse me, <clears throat> not only in Washington, D.C., but the surrounding counties, um, making up the national capital region. Now, we didn't stop there because we recognized that just being able to talk for first responders wasn't enough. So we had we designed and implemented a broad, the first publicly owned broadband network. Now that was important because at the time, carrier costs were so high, cities couldn't afford it. So what we did was say, you know, we'll do it ourselves. And we did it, we launched it. And that became a, a test bed in Washington, DC used by both federal, state and local first responders back in 2004 when we launched it. Mm. That became the basis of what we know and the study behind a report that went to the president in 2006. That's another thing that went to President Bush. And that became a part of the FirstNet legislation, which we know today is a FirstNet uh, deployment. Um, that FirstNet deployment finally is um, 
very big because that legislation um, opened up airways specifically for our first responders and um, also investment for our first responders. Um, there have been, um, um, and you know, I'm working, my firm works with um, Verizon Wireless, who we prou we're proud to say um, has, has uh, developed solutions to meet those requirements and meeting and has bettered our communication systems for our, for our first responders throughout the United States. Let me just give you a sense of what we're talking sure. about. You know, when you design um, public safety broadband networks, you kind of say, okay, well, citizens are just here. So, we, you know, you can, you can design them based on where populations can, you know, show up. Well, you know, it's really important to, to, to identify that when you're on a carrier's network, everyone will, will go to a congested area and you won't have enough network there to satisfy all of those things. Well, as a part of that legislation, um, we have preemption and priority over carrier networks, which means, um, you know, should a carrier decide like Verizon to invest in this for our first responders, which they did, they get preemption and priority over the communications that therefore allow them to continue to communicate even in congested or difficult times. That's as a result of the, the legislation and as a result of, of Verizon and other carriers um, um, investing to, to be a part of that. And I'm very, really, really proud of that work because that wow. made a difference in the times that we just went through. If you think about our, our civil unrest and a difficulty and how crowds suddenly showed up here and how first responders had to respond to those crowds, both you know emergency um, responders who are trying to you know get people who have been hurt or police who are trying to contain an area. So consequently, um, having communication systems that allow them to continue to communicate no matter where crowds go was essential for the security of our country. Wow. And so you were, uh, you're on the ground floor of this um, to allow folks to, to, to talk. I mean, the, <laughs> the way I used to do it when I was in the military was a Mars station, military operated, you know, affiliated radio system. So I was, I was ham operated trying to get the, yep. the last, like, the last <laughs> lines out a <laughs> little, little, di right. little different, right? I can, so I can, <laughs> you know, I have my little radio dialing it in, man, doing my net control mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about this, and I think these are the things that people just don't understand. As a leader, you know, you you, you begin seeing the need. How is it that you know you, you talked about nine eleven? You know, the tragedy, the, the tragedy there that kind of you know ripped the country. And then and then you you talk about um, some of the other um, you know devastations that happen where, where police and fire just can't communicate. Uh, how do you see the solution for it when? you are that deputy that comes in and says, okay, I'm going to get all this money. There's got to be some, some hurdles that are in front of you. Oh boy. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, there, there are plenty of hurdles, especially when you birth something. Okay. Yeah. When you're um, at the edge of things and technology or anything for that matter, there's a lot of risk. Um, but what we recognized was the technology at the time for push to talk was exactly pushing to talking. And at the time we were like, hey, first responders need so much more. And wouldn't it be great if they had this situational awareness, if they had um, information about a building before they ran in it, and if they had video, a video from a helicopter above that showed you infrared hot spots on the top so you know not to walk on those places in the top, wouldn't it be great, sorry, wouldn't it be great if we at all of if we could provide all of that to our first responders at the scene we established mm -hmm. that vision because you know frankly commuting back when we were in church and when i was commuting in washington dc and i was going to work every day it was frankly frightening because i knew at the time that some of those communication systems weren't working and wouldn't work should there be a tragedy so you know nothing like fear to inspire you you know you're in a, <laughs> you're in a metro with everyone else and you're like you know i know the communication system down here doesn't work but i'm working <laughs> on it right now so fortunately we got it fixed but i gotta get um, to work i gotta get to yeah. work so we gotta yeah. fix this communication gotta fix this. <laughs> yeah there's, there's a little inspiration when it's like in your backyard so that wasn't the only inspiration um, but that was certainly extra inspiration when you're in the middle of it but i mean it's got to be challenging right so you you have because these these departments you know they're you know in, in such a hotbed pol political city um, left and right with Washington, D.C., you know, it can be quickly that somebody turns and says, well, how come we're using these funds to go this way? Yeah, we need to we need to protect and get 
fire get the get the protective gear for our our, our first responders. We need to we need the money to go to this stuff. We what are you talking about communications? Right? How do you uh, make the you, argument? Were you in the meetings? Stuff? You must have been in the in the in the national capital region NCR uh, <laughs> budget meetings. Oh my God! So. Fortunately, um, out of a tragedy in 1983, when that plane crashed in the, in the Potomac, there was a there was a jurisdictional um, there was just jurisdictional confusion. Who owned the response, right? So the leaders back in 1983 in Washington D.C. area came up with the National Capital Region, the Council of Governance, mm -hmm. and you know that is a special place because that's where. We all, the IT people get together, the police get together, the fire get together. And now you got these these mini teams, you know? So you, so it actually, from a government standpoint, the IT people were kind of together. And, you know, so so it adds a whole bunch of more complexities. But yes, I did absolutely have to sell um, using those NCR funds to, to implement this project. And it did take um, some, some convincing, especially when you're looking at conventional communications versus, you know, next generation communications. And that always is a hard sell for folks who need it now. So um, fortunately, we were able to, um, you know, convince them and we were able to be successful at it. At time. So, so there, Robert, there's, there's some adaptability that has to happen here. And as we look at, you know, People want to, as much as they would love to, they try to push me in my in my keynotes beyond the pandemic. I said, well, we're still here, right? And so, and so I often will take people back to the last time I believe America was truly resilient, uh, which was World War II. And, you know, so those folks were nine, 10 years afterwards, Great Depression, all these things that were going on before kind of the war and everything. So when you look at where we are today, how have you used some of those strategies as a, you know, in your leadership to help other people kind of get through these, these tough times? Because 9-11 was hard. You know, the Potomac 1983, that was a hard thing with a, a plane going into Potomac. Those were, were challenging moments. How do you, when you, and you're leading in moments of crisis, how do you help other leaders, like I'm talking to today at Deloitte University for um, these, these, uh, these attorneys who are, you know, the ones that are going to be trying to make policies for this? How, how do you lead in those, in those, um, in those type of examples, in those, in those times of crisis? Well, you know, uh, life has uh, lessons. And if we pay attention, you know, mm. You know, if it's a lesson, if you pay attention, it's a, probably a punishment if you don't. Um, and, uh, you know, early in life, um, you know, I, I, you know, 41 years ago, a matter of fact, I, um, you know, we had some difficulties in my family and I found myself at 17 years old needing to sell the furniture in our family house in order to mm -hmm. pay for my tuition um, at the time of a private high school I was attending in, in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Central Catholic. Um, and from that time on, I was technically and financially on my own. I lived with my grandparents, so, you know, I applied to college and I, and I went to college and certainly family was absolutely 100% behind me, but the, the responsibility of me became me at that time and, you know, me exclusively. Um, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, that's an interesting place to find yourself in that youthful thing. And you're often, I, I found myself at the crossroads. Um, is, you know, and at the time, John, I'll be honest with you. I was even, that was my moment of doubting God. I was actually mm -hmm. at that Catholic high school. I took a class called atheism and belief. And the, remember the instructor, the first day of, of class came in and said there was a chocolate cake on the table. And we were like, Hey, yes, absolutely. We're hungry. <laughs> and then he's like, you know, there was no cake on the table, which was depressing, but he's like, okay, tell me where God is. Right. And it was a, it was a very interesting class probably the only class other than physics that I remember and um, that I remember, but um, it also gave me um, um, the tools needed to understand faith better and understand how faith is not physical oftentimes. And um, that, that in that situation that I was in, while I blame God for what was happening, um, I came to realize that God was acting in that moment and protecting me and therefore um, was worthy to continue to, to follow and appraise. And the second thing that I said was, um, anytime something happens to me, life, positive, negative, no matter what happens, I'm going to use it as fuel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fuel. So that moment you have a millisecond to determine what you're going to do when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. You can determine you're going to make something positive happen or something negative. 
Yeah. And from that yeah. point on in my life, that's what's been driving me. And that's what I continue to do when I'm in that moment of crisis. Like, what's the positive thing I can do at that moment? Don't think about anything else about the positive thing and execute. And then I move on. You are saying something that's powerful. You are saying something that I often will, will share with audiences. And so you know, without even knowing that you're going to say that, is that I, I often will share that the the hurdle that's in front of you is your hurdle. Uh, you have to attack your own hurdle. And we can give you tools, like you sell furniture, whatever it might be, to, to give yourself the runway. But eventually, you have to make this decision in that millisecond that you're going to take the hurdle. Um, and no one can do it for you. You have to do that uh, yourself. Um, and so that that's a that's a really great, uh, great analogy. So, you know, when you talk about all these things and the adversities that you had to face, what were some of the things, you know, you talk about going back to Philly and the, and the high school, what were some of the other things that you had to face that really kind of what you would say would define you and like who you are and began shaping the Robert Legrand to make these uh, these hard call decisions uh, that we see later on? Well, um, so at the time when I was at my grandparents' house going away to college, um, I call it the suitcase philosophy. And I remember this like it was just yesterday. And I got another philosophy I'll tell you about later called the farmer's <laughs> philosophy. Um, yeah, I want, to, I want to know about that because I got this in my notes too. And then we got Jeff Woods just came on. Yeah, I, we ran track, and so we were at the Olympic trials together in 1992. So he's saying, Mr. Grant, thank you for sharing that experience. Very powerful. So we're going to I really appreciate that. Um, so um, there's a suitcase, and I'm packing up my grandparents' old you know, suitcase to go to college, and I'm putting stuff in. And um, I'm thinking about um, you know the people in my life and the – um, mistakes they made and the positive things they made and the mistakes they made. I remember putting them outside mentally, putting them outside the suitcase. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do this. And the positive things they were doing, I'm going to put this in a suitcase. I'm going to put that in a suitcase. Um, I was blessed to have um, very strong and influential men in my family to include my dad um, um, and had, um, you know, there there were mistakes and there were um, accomplishments made on, on, on all sides of everything. Um, from each one of those men in my life and women, um, I took their um, that experience they had and I just put it in my suitcase as um, experience for me to apply. And that's that's that was the suitcase, suitcase philosophy that I applied to life and I still apply to life. Because I, you know, I look around and I grab things and I try to say, okay, well, John, oh, you, you know, like when you, John, you're, I mean, you're just inspirational. Just want, I mean, just, just, you know, <laughs> I mean, you just, you just, you're inspirational. I mean, you're, um, as an amputee, it, it's almost just so we can see you, you know, just, mm -hmm. just because you're so, I mean, you're, it's not that, I mean, you are, you're just, your spirit is, is there's a spirit there with you that I have always admired in church and the determination. And I took that with me. So when I'm watching you up there playing the piano and, and singing and, and doing everything you can to, to, to praise that to me is motivation. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get my butt to church. <laughs> you know, let's go. And so it's a philosophy of, of, of suitcase through life. You walk through life through it with a suitcase and you take the things in life with you that um, you see from others that can help you yeah. be better. I've applied that as well. Yeah. And, and, and I've seen, and I've seen, you know, your, your beautiful children, you, you looks like they are doing kind of following after dad's footsteps, right? Is so there's a legacy piece that looks like it's going on with that as well. Well, that's the farmer's philosophy. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Um, so um, <laughs> in 2000, I don't know, 2007, when I started our company, uh, my daughter, uh, Ariel, as you know, was walking by my, my office at home. And that was my my PC. That was my own entire business. And she said, "Dad, what are you doing?" <laughs> I looked at her. I said, "Spreadsheets." <laughs> and you know, I'm a consultant. <laughs> so guess what you're doing now? Spreadsheets. <laughs> so the farmer's philosophy <laughs> was: if you're if you're a farmer's kid, you're a farmer. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, actually, you can be a doctor, engineer, what you want, but <laughs> until you're 18, you're a farmer. You're a farmer. <laughs> you're a farmer. So. At that moment, now Ariel at the time I think was like you know 15, 16 years old, and she was my first employee, and and then subsequently, shortly after that, all of my children became employees, and it, you know because they tell you well don't talk about business or I don't talk about work around the table. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Every parent in their work, if they would share it with their children, will advance them and give them transferable skills that they can use because they're in a constant competition with other kids. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and if you just and, and, and kids are typically they go to school and then they end up working later on and get that experience. Well, if you give them that experience earlier, oh, my goodness, you put your kids in a better competitive situation um, in life. And those are transferable skills, even if they didn't want to be engineers or climb poles like my sons actually do to mm -hmm. install our networks and systems that we're doing. Um, it would have them the skills to say, I know how to do that and I can apply that to what I wanted to do. So, you know, wow. that's the pharma philosophy that I applied. They have, believe it or not, all, the youngest one, Razel, is 25, and he now has, Razel now has, 20, at 25, he now has now 15 years experience working in a company. He started with with uh, lining up receipts from 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 um, excuse me, from um, from business trips that Ariel would enter in for my for my invoices, and now he's leading a project to deploy a advanced solution on Clark Atlanta University in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, you're saying this and I, and I, this is something that, um, is resonating with me because I will share this with both young folks that are going into say, say, let's take, take sports, for example. Um, and there's a, there are a couple of kids that are, that might make it to, you know, the, the next level, the college level. Mm -hmm. And then there's a few of those that may make it all the way, you know, to the NFL, NBA or something. Mm -hmm. So I never discounted a, a, a kid's dream in, in that. You know, I, I just say, if that's what you want to do, then you got to you know, put it, put in the hours, put in the work and let's find the opportunities because you can put in as much work as you want to. But if, let's, let's face it, if you look at the opportunities, um, you're not, <laughs> you're not going. So, um, and then on the other side, I'll talk to, uh, folks that say, "Oh, these these athletes are making so much money, and this all this stuff," <laughs> and 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 they they think that there's an association on that that kind of the early curve, of what you're or the early kind of outset of what you're talking about with this this growth set that um, there's something that should have been delayed for them. They should not have had the access to that opportunity. And I say, well, that to that group there, I'll say, <clears throat> you know, that child. They started learning how to do their craft at six years old. And they went to their little peewee league and they kept on going all the way up. And now when they're 29, they've had their work life while you're just beginning yours. And so how would you have done it? They've, they've had their work experience and now they well, can go know, to a different career. You know, so as a business person, I would I would laugh at the that expression. It's like, wait a minute. First of all, they're 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 given that no, they generate that revenue. Okay, let's be That's clear. Right. Yeah, let's talk. Absolutely. So let's start. So when somebody says that to me and they say, Well, athletes make I say, No, 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 stop, stop. You're saying it wrong. They generate that much revenue, and that's right. their revenue, that is their proportional share of that. And right. boy, they must be at 25 years old. You're able to generate enough revenue that you get paid $25 million. You, my friend, are, are doing well, and you should be doing well because you must be generating $300 million. So, so that's no, that's right. just, let's just change that conversation and end it right there. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the other, because the, that's where we go, going right to the piece is because who's paying it? Who's yeah. paying the salary? It's the owners. <laughs> so the you're generator, generating the yeah. revenue for the owners to pay you that much money. Okay. So how so much? Are, so, so so the question that becomes: How much revenue are you generating for your employer to pay you what your salary is? Bingo! That is <laughs> right. that is, that changes the conversation, and that right. really ends it with most people because they like donors, you know, billions of dollars, and it's like, oh, okay, so it's a fraction of what they actually make. Yes, just right. like everybody yeah. else's business, <laughs> they are employees and they are generating <laughs> revenue. And it's a lot, and their salaries on display. Put the owner's salaries on display, and the conversation will end. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, yeah, I think that's. It's, I think it's. It's really. A, but I, as we talk about it from the the, the 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 farmer's philosophy, is you're doing that right. You are you are building at a younger age to, to give um, either advancement or the work experience or something to generate, just like in in um investments right we want to invest early because mm -hmm. the, the, over the long time it's, it's going to pay out dividends higher if i start mm -hmm. at 15 
versus if I start at 30, right? So there, there's, there's that. And so I think that's really fantastic of what you're saying and how you are, you know, moving this in this whole conversation from, uh, not from, but adding to uh, what you had to, to deal with in what you did in selling off your the furniture to get through school, that move then put you in position later on to have a, a, a deeper conversation, well, the military too, but then a, a deeper conversation on how you're going to uh, put things into the suitcase in order uh, to have the communications network bl uh, blow out for first responders uh, all, all across the, the nation now. Right. It's, it's the, the policies that you put in place are just people don't see the under. That's why I wanted you on to see the under uh, tones of, of a person's life and, and how you um, how people can elevate. How do others see their potential in your in your words? How how do others see their potential to, to, to know that they're adding value and that this value will matriculate somehow down the road to maybe cause impact? Not maybe not this huge impact like that, but it, it is causing impact. Well, you know, the, the digital decision, I'm very proud to say, is made up of um, a number. If you look at our website, a number of first responders, <clears throat> former first responders, um, police chiefs, colonels of state patrols and police, um, as well as geeks like myself and, of course, a, a married of Legrand uh, family members. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, you want to go back to a really you know, challenging time for us. Let's let's talk about that civil unrest, right? Let's talk about that period of time that's still in our country, but not as at the height that it was um, um, some time ago. You know, that was a an incredibly difficult time for um, for everyone. Um, you know, and uh, especially police that don't subscribe to you know those 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 terrible things that break in the law, as we saw and we see. Um, you know, but we, through that period, you know, we, we really bonded even more. You know, we were there more for each other. Um, we talked more about what was going on and we talked about the solutions to those problems. And, you know, we, you know, we definitely um, became more inspired about helping our customer have better communication systems because at the end of the day, um, you know, in order for us to really discern what's going on in our streets and, you know, rural, urban, suburban streets, um, it's important for us to have eyes on the situation. Um, the tragedy that we saw um, unfold in Minneapolis, for example, was as a result, the reason why we saw it is because of communication systems. So mm. the important thing for us is to make sure, you know, from our, from what, what can we do in society to benefit society? And our benefit is helping customers, uh, our customers and building better communication systems that will help better um, protect us, you know, from ourselves and from others. Um, yeah. And um, we applied, you know, those, those difficult, you know, again, the, the, the philosophy that I have is when there's a tragedy, you have two choices, millisecond, you can make it better, you can make it worse. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, as difficult and hurtful as it was, um, we all collectively um, worked amongst ourselves to make it better for ourselves and work even harder to make it better for our country. And, and, and so that's where you see that philosophy early on played out in, and even now and how yeah. I led our team through, um, through this period of time, which was difficult for everyone and um, especially for us. Yeah. Well, you know, even with that, when you make the, the analogy to um, to uh, convicted felon Chauvin now and prisoner felon Chauvin, my 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 cousin had he, he was a Minneapolis police officer and in narcotics area, knocking down doors and stuff. So he was uh, felon Chauvin was on his team, you know, um, and but he never had any issues during that. So somewhere afterwards, because he ran a tight ship. Right. And, and you and you were held accountable for every single action that you did. So we see where it works. Right. We see the communications and the effective communication of if I hold you accountable, <laughs> it changes behavior. It changes uh, behavior. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it, <laughs> you got a, you got a so, camera right here. 
<laughs> so I, it's, it's not rocket science, right? It's not. It's not very difficult. So I. So I, I, I was speaking, Robert, to a group. Uh, who was it? Was a group of executives, group of CEOs uh, for uh, I think it was Newell Brands, right? <laughs> so and I'd say this all the time. So, and, and so. Um, um, they're, they're, they make Sharpies and they they do the Yankee candles uh, and, the, and their leader, Robbie Selegram, is just one of the most amazing. I'm going to have him on the show, too. He's this amazing guy. Um, and he's turned all these companies around. He's just kind of this he's an he's an Indian um, American and he has a. Um, a British accent, right? So it's just lovely. <laughs> he's got this, this British accent that he has. Uh, <laughs> and I just, he's, he's just, I just fell in love with this guy. Uh, so, um, so anyway, I'm, we're talking, we're having this conversation and, and I, I don't really call myself a speaker. I mean, people find me as a keynote speaker or motivational speaker or inspirational speaker, but I'm really a facilitator of the brilliance that's already in the room, right? That's really what I, I do. So once it comes up, and so we're having this conversation, uh, and I say to them, uh, "You have to enact whatever it is what that you're working on right now. You have to have a system where you know you're going to get it done. So you have to be accountable, right? And so that, that I said, so how do you know you're going to be accountable? And they say, well, I'll be accountable tomorrow. And I said, okay, that's great. But I said, in my life, I rarely hold myself accountable to this stuff. <laughs> I always make, I negotiate with myself. Okay, I'm the, you said chocolate cake earlier. The, yeah, I'm not going to eat the chocolate cake because I'm on a diet and it's Lent. <laughs> but I'm going to have a piece of that chocolate cake. You know, I'll do it next year. <laughs> I'll, so, I'll, so I will share this one for a lot because I had to come up with something in order, you know, with kids, you got to keep coming up with terms and stuff to try to make a point. And, I, you know, and we got into this debate of excuses versus reasons. Right? Yeah, yeah. OK, OK. Yeah. And so to simplify it, I was like, OK, that's an excuse. Excuses are bad. Like now, a reason is what you have after you exhausted all possible excuses. So, um, you know, that is. um you know that that to me reverses the 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 you know that whole thinking of how you would attack something and you're attacking it saying okay let me identify proactively those excuses and make sure that those those are not a reason because you know his excuses will are, are a sign of true failure so <laughs> well, we say that excuses are monuments of nothingness they build Absolutely. bridges to nowhere. nowhere. And people who use these <laughs> tools of incompetence are masters of nothing. <laughs> you obviously learned that from a certain fraternal <laughs> pledging that was similar to mine. I, I have my own. I get a tick every time I, I yeah, see it. It's like, <laughs> um, so I, I, told the, I told this group, I said, um, Here's, here's what I invite you to do. I said, obviously, I'm the closing speaker, so obviously you should have learned something over the course of these past two, three days that you have all been together. So the, the one thing that rises to the top that you know that you need to do, that you have to make that commitment to, I want you to begin work on it by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. You don't have to get the whole thing done, but do one thing towards it, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And, and I invite you to find somebody in this room to call them at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning with the action step that you just took. And man, <laughs> people were squirming <laughs> because we don't want, I think that's one of the things we don't want to be held accountable. And it was tough for me when I, when I started joining mastermind groups to say, okay, I'm going to do this. And the next week they're holding me accountable to the thing I said I was going to do. And it's, it pushes you to to work on what you, you've you identified as the most important thing. Uh, and that helps, I think, us get all the way further down the road. Well, Your thoughts? I, I totally agree with that. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, just the shortest distance between two points, basic physics is straight line. Mm -hmm. And um, and clearly, if you have a challenge, obstacle, or otherwise in your life, and you're trying to go around it, it's going to take you more time. Yeah, trying to go under it. It's going to take you more time. If you go straight at it, it's the shortest distance to resolve it. Um, so there's the philosophy right there. Uh, you know, you you um, you you um, you don't run necessarily to your challenge. You don't run away from it, but you make sure you identify it and plan to do something about it. Do not 
let circumstances allow you to do other things around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the, the attack, the attack of the hurdle, the, we call it linear expression and, and, and the, in the, the hundred meter dash, you got the, you don't want to cut anything off. You don't want to be going left or right. You want linear expression down the track. Um, and that's, that's what gets us to where we are. So, uh, Carolyn Strauss says, thank you. Lovely conversation, John and Robert. Uh, Jeff says, uh, great point. As, as we, as soon as we decide to toe the line, we have won. We have to take the hurdles that life places in front of us, take and attack those hurdles. Uh, and so we want to just, I kind of want to honor those folks for, for chiming in on, on the conversation. Anything that we have left out before we get ready to, to wrap the show? Uh, you know, just, uh, no, I think I expressed everything that I wanted to, to share, or at least thought about sharing with you when you asked yeah. for me to come on. Um, I made it my spiritual point, which was, um, to, to your listeners and people, um, you know, I'm not, you know, going to tell you what faith, um, to follow, but I will tell you that there is, um, you know, the, the faith that I follow has brought me, um, um, has brought me, um, balance. It brought me direction and, um, and it is, um, you know, and it, 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 it has definitely made a difference in everything that I shared today from the farmer's philosophy and, and other philosophies that I apply. Um, faith is, um, uh, is an essential ingredient to yeah. give you, to give you more, um, to make it. When you, when you said f farmer's philosophy, my mind went to the restaurant I love to go into in, in Washington, D.C., and that's Founding Farmers. <laughs> I always I find myself place. over there. <laughs> nice place. I'll just say <laughs> that's, that's a shameless plug for Founding Farmers yeah, really. in Washington, D.C. And, yeah. Or a Ben's Chili Bowl, too. So you got that. So pay, bring your cash and get some Ben's Chili Bowl <laughs> over there. Um, Robert, thanks for for being on. How do people find your company? And you know, to if they're out there right now, executives that are looking to you know expand their communication or you know kind of doing the things that that you would offer those services, help them understand how they might be able to find you. Well, I appreciate that, John. Um, TheDigitalDecision.com is our website, um, and certainly you can contact and see us there. The types of things that we offer, we're a consultancy where we help. Um, um, companies um, to uh, deploy and uh, to maintain uh, public safety communication systems. Um, and we're subject matter experts at that. Um, we're also subject matter experts at um, integration. I mentioned that I um, worked on you know, submarines and things like that before. And I took that philosophy, if you will, from Lockheed Martin, which I was proud to work for, and applied it to where um, we have integrated some of the most, um, I would say, innovative solutions. And we now have bringing, we're bringing products um, to the market. Um, and those solutions are community-based solutions that will help with, um, with, with and, and it's the internet of things and leveraging um, that technology to provide um, more security in a community and actually build more trust while you're doing it. So if you go back to what we went through, um, that came out of um, the, you know, the tragedy and, and the civil unrest. What came out of our, um, came out of that from our team was to build systems that improve public safety, but also improve public trust. And that's what we're bringing to market. We're proud of it. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for, for being on. I, I really, uh, I really appreciate you being on the show today. So I'll get ready to wrap it up uh, here, but stay on just for a moment as we get ready to go. Everybody, Robert Legrand, uh, just fantastic um, uh, show for us today. And thank you for your gifting and, and what you have brought. Uh, blessings to you, your family. Uh, you, you all continue to be fantastic friends. So so thank you for coming on. We'll get ready to wrap this show, everybody. Uh, give a give a hand, give the applause, give the thumbs up, give the hearts, whatever you got to do uh, for the one and only Robert Legrand. We have, uh, we'll have another great guest on coming up. I usually do these shows on Thursday, but you know, we're on the road again and I'm, I'm doing it from hotels now. So hopefully <laughs> uh, you are hearing uh, this, this, um, 
this this session uh, from wherever you're listening from if, and you're hearing it okay through the uh, the hotel internet. So if you have a great suggestion who is a leader uh, and they've gone through some type of challenge most leaders have, uh, please introduce them through me and they, if, they, if you think they'll be a great guest in the show through a DM. Um, I'm here most Thursdays and we always talk about Inspire Communications, how we help uh, business professionals to hurdle adversity, amputate their fear, embrace a new normal mindset to win the medals that are in their lives. Our One of our philosophies is to go forth and inspire your world. Why? Because go is your command, forth is your direction, inspire is your vocation, your, because only you can do this work and world because it's your sphere of influence. We'll see you back here next next time on another episode of Life's New Normal on the cut of our virtual podcast. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye.